So he no longer rejects this. Now humans, in contrast to bees, the variations in between different groups is determined culturally, not genetically, and that can be shown by the homologue of the requeening experiment, and done, for example, by Carlton Gajdusek, the man who first studied Kuru in the New Guinea Highlands, one of the most primitive societies known, who brought back a large number of children and sent them to college in America, and lo and behold, they didn't end up as New Guinea Highlanders, they ended up as American college students. Um, and had acquired by their education all the cultural characteristics that this involves. So this experiment in humans gives exactly the same uh, opposite result. And now natural selection and cultural evolution uh, is different from that in genetic evolution where the phenotype follows the genotype automatically, but to allow culturally determined variation to undergo selection, as I've already told you, the variants have to be preserved over a lot of people and a lot of generations for selection actually to have an effect. And these cultural patterns of behavior have nearly always been expressed in the form of religious prescriptions. And the generation of these cultural variants and their enforcement, I will argue, have given religions a vital evolutionary function. And I will give you a timeline again for this. If you now regard the existence of Homo sapiens sapiens as a year, the first probable religious artifacts about 10 months ago, burials at the Adzi Cave in Israel. I'm um, indebted to my wife, who is an archaeologist, for all these figures. The Venus figurines in Europe, about five months ago. The first ritual structures at Katwahuyuk, about three and a half weeks ago. Uh, the first monotheistic religion, Akhenaten, in Egypt, uh, about 10 days ago. And there are probably no older extant religions at the moment than that. So, in fact, the religions we know about are all extremely recent. Unfortunately, if we accept the fact that uh, religion has been maintaining cultural evolution for a long time, we have this disadvantage that we don't actually know the prescriptions of many of these much older religions because nobody wrote them down. We know about their artifacts and we know a bit about their ritual, but we know very little about their prescriptions. Um, so a religion, I'm happy with uh, Samuel Johnson's definition of religion, which is virtue. Um, uh, based upon the reverence of God and expectation of future um, uh, punishments, uh, rewards and punishments, uh, except I will point out in a moment, of course, not all religions have gods, um, uh, though most contemporary ones do. And virtue, as Samuel Johnson uses, encapsulates the behavioral prescription, the shall shalts and thou shalt not, and that is the core of all existing religions, and I will argue probably of all earlier ones too. And as far as I'm concerned, virtually is, is essentially the same as ethics. This is actually defining ethics. This gives ethics a definition. This definition suits me fine, but the philosophers present may find it a little oversimplistic. Um, the virtue um, deals with rather particular topics in nearly all religions, which are things which are important in life. Uh, they lead to diet and health, to reproductive behavior, to interpersonal relationships, to attitudes to work, to attitudes to death and suicide, um, and a variety of other things. Um, uh, I have tables of this too, which my wife prepared, but I don't have time to show them to you, it's a pity. I'll just point one thing to you. Of the extant religions, it's really quite interesting. Christianity is the only religion that has no prescription with regard to washing, um, which is quite interesting, but they've nevertheless survived. Um, you would have thought it was a disadvantage. Um, uh, virtue, however, in all religions, is very concerned with increasing population. And the ethical paradigm of all existing religions is that of an endangered species. Uh, males having to feed and defend their mates, and females their primary obligation to breed. And I always point out that this is recognized in Norse religion, that Valhalla is reserved for men who die in battle and women who die in childbirth. Unfortunately, this paradigm has, for the last 200 years, become unadaptive. Um, um, as I will explain in a moment. Um, the rest of religion, the reverence of God and expectation of future rewards and punishments, as I say, not all religions have gods. The original form of Buddhism uh, didn't. Um, Confucianism, which in my terms is certainly a religion, um, didn't either. Uh, Many, but not all, religions believe in an afterlife. Others believe in reincarnation. Three minutes. I shall be five. <laughs> um, uh, the will of God, um, 
and hopes and fears enforce the prescription by a mixture of wish fulfillment, fear fulfillment, and unfortunately, frequently, a great deal of actual physical coercion. Uh, the ethical, the mystical Struber structure does not have to be accurate, as I point out here with a couple of examples. Um, the prescriptions were very successful. Uh, we don't have to believe um, uh, the mythical superstructure. But it does need to be effective. Um, uh, if religions don't preserve their prescriptions, uh, then they will lose their function. And that explains the fact that religions are intolerant. And that gives rise to severe problems of religion, as fundamentalism, persecution, and wars. But I regard this as the toxic side effects of a medicine we need, whereas people like Richard Dawkins regard this as pure psychopathology, but it is a downside which is rather unfortunate. But a religion showing unlimited tolerance to other religions would lose its, um, its, its functions. Um, how does religion uh, 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 innovation arise? Well, probably not in most cases by prophets going into the desert to speculate how their descendants in the nth generation are going to survive. Um, though Buddha did think about um, what was needed to uh, achieve nirvana, and it's probable that the innovations are Popperian in nature, they're random or due to irrelevant reasons. And the reasons for their introduction are rarely, if ever, related to their advantage. I give male circumcision here. God knows what, nobody knows why it was introduced, but um, it probably survived because it gives resistance to sexually transmitted disease. And apropos of something that John said, uh, cannibalism probably died out because those who practiced this developed um, spongiform encephalopathies and died, and so they left no descendants. So those that didn't do cannibalism did better. Um, the implications of this hypothesis, uh, very briefly, is there must be a degree of free will, which is why some theologians don't find this um, altogether unacceptable. Genetic determinism of behavior can be rejected. Religions need to be intolerant, and ethics forms the basis of selection. And this is where I disagree totally with uh, T.H. Huxley, who wrote the first book on ethics and evolution in 1893. And he says that ethics is there to counteract the cosmic struggle, that we have ethics to prevent evolution getting out of hand. Of course, he didn't know about cultural evolution, didn't know about genetic evolution either because nobody knew about genes. But I think this is totally wrong. And as the minister actually said this morning, I was pleased to hear, ethics evolve. It's quite clear that ethics evolve like everything else evolves. Huxley regarded ethics as fixed and probably derived from God. I'm not quite sure about that. And this view is still held by those who believe in natural law, who believe in a fixed ethics. But you really can't take this too seriously. Even in historical times, cultures have held widely different views, I say here, on slavery, human sacrifice, cannibalism, suicide, and lots of other things. And you really have to take the strange view that our ancestors were all moral imbeciles if you believe they had our ethics and totally failed to observe them. And that really is a very ethnocentric and very unreasonable view. So the ethics have changed, they get better. Well, sometimes they get worse. One of the problems of the 20th century is that we had ethical experiments that were quite horrific and which fortunately none of them lasted very much. I mean, the view that the fetus is ensouled at conception, which gives the Roman Catholic Church so much trouble, was a 19th century invention by Pius IX when he tried to keep up with uh, 19th century embryology. He didn't keep up with it far enough, unfortunately. The concept of human rights has evolved since the European Enlightenment, um, as you all know. And those ethical rules that have survived over most cultures and over longest periods of times are those we now regard as universally applicable. That's entirely acceptable. Uh, argument. Um, I won't say anything about this in the secular world. There is some separation from church and state, but I would point out to you that it is the norm in modern secular society for skeptics like me, like John Harris, to accept the ethical prescriptions of the religions they grew up among, which after all have evolved and which we think are good and proper without believing any of their superstructure. That isn't just common, it's the norm. But very few uh, skeptics who actually reject the religious prescription in general, especially its more important parts. There are odd bits they will. On the future, well, I've said, this is really where we come to this meeting, last minute. Increasing population has undermined the ethical paradigm which underlines all modern religions, that of an endangered species. We're now an endangering species. This needs to change. And 
that change will affect the right to breed, it will affect the working of democracy between groups, not within groups. One cannot allow groups who refuse to contain their populations to dictate to those who don't, and it will change the world relation between man and the physical environment. I might just point out that women's liberation and gay rights are both parts of this paradigm change that have occurred, so it's not all bad. These are not new ideas, but they were unadaptive in the past. And the secular religions of the 20th century show that cultural evolution can take serious wrong turns. Um, but as I've already said, this is the last slide we've put here. The essential problem which this meeting has to face, already been said by John Sulston, is, is to control population growth or to reverse it, uh, which will require substantial changes to religious and ethical prescriptions. All other changes, um, to a green economy, a secondary, and will at best delay the anticipated apocalypse by a few years. Doesn't mean they're not worth doing, but they're very limited use. And one very final point to something that John Sulston says, the projections for the growth of human population have of course declined considerably in the last 20 years. And this is ascribed on the one hand to increased education of women and the other to increased affluence. And I think that a prescription that says we should try to reverse the increase of affluence as a method of controlling uh, the green economy may have unfortunate side effects on population growth, and we should really think about that very carefully. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for a most uh, interesting and uh, stimulating uh, talk on uh, science, innovation, religion, and cultural evolution. I'm sure uh, Father Elpidophoros will have much to comment later when I open the floor to discussion. Um, what I would like to keep from um, your talk uh, for myself, apart from the fact that bees do not die when they uh, bite other, <laughs> when they sting other insects, is that um, the shortness of time that it took us as a living species to become the masters of the earth and of its resources, and how responsible we are for uh, maintaining them. Also, I'd like to add that there has been recently a monograph by Jeffrey Miller, who is, of all things, a professor of banking law at uh, the uh, New York University, on why the Hebrew, the Hebrew Bible uh, and the Ten Commandments were a form of political organization, and as a matter of fact, the ethical premises of the Bible were a form of so the original form of a social contract. Um, having said that, I am acutely aware that we are running late, and um, I, we are going to have a very interesting panel discussion, but um, I'd like now to break uh, for, to have a 10 minute coffee break and reconvene in exactly 10 minutes to continue with our panel discussion and then take questions from the floor. See you in 10 minutes. <laughs>